Good morning. This is Mars. A very beautiful image of Mars. This is actually a real digital elevation map constructed by hundreds of satellite overflights and the data rendered to give you the perspective of flying at about 40,000 feet, like you would in a jet. It's a very special place on Mars. It's called the Gale Crater. You can see the rim of the crater in the edge of this image, and rising out of the crater floor, the massive Mount Sharp, over 5,000 meters high. And down there in the shadows, between the proverbial rock of the crater rim and the foothills of Mount Sharp, there's a rover named Curiosity. And it is, was, my greatest professional honor to lead the team that put her there. Uh, it was um, a, a bit of an amazing feat. Uh, some people called it crazy. But the story of getting to Mars and making that landing happening happen does not start on Mars. For me, my journey starts here. Uh, I was a poor student. This is the San Francisco Bay Area. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. I was a poor student in high school. After barely passing my high school, I played rock and roll. I was playing rock and roll, hoping to become the next Elvis Costello. And one night, returning home from playing a show, I noticed that the stars were in a different place in the night sky than they had been when I went out to to play the show. In fact, up in the upper left there, you see that constellation of Orion. It was that constellation, although I didn't know its name at the time. It had been in the east as I went out, and it was in the west as I came home, and I was mystified. I was amazed at the motion of the stars in the night sky. I had missed that whole Earth spinning on its axis thing in high school. I got curious, and I followed my curiosity down to my local college, uh, community college, College of Marin, to take an astronomy course to teach me why the stars were moving. It had a prerequisite of a physics course. I thought, physics, mm, I'm not so sure. And then I read the subscript. It said, physics for poets. Physics without math. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that might work. So I signed up for the course. And thank heavens that I did. Because that instructor in that course took the spark of curiosity I had experienced when I looked up and saw the motion of the stars in the night sky, and it turned it into a fire of exploration that has burned across my life and changed the course of my life, and perhaps changed the way we land on Mars. If Adam of yesteryear were to know what Adam of today's job is, his head would have exploded. But thank God we never really know where our curiosity might take us. So that's kind of what I want to talk to you today about. Curiosity and exploration. You know, curiosity is the spark, and exploration is the fire that burns from it. In some sense, my life represents two arcs, two parallel arcs of curiosity and exploration. First, my professional life, I actually helped land a rover named Curiosity on the surface of Mars to do our collective exploration. And the second arc being the personal one, the the journey of exploration I began when I allowed myself to be moved by my curiosity and go take that class so many years ago. So let's talk about Mars. For eons, Mars has captivated our attention. From before we had aids to our vision, we looked up at the night sky and we saw a light a little brighter, a little redder than the other lights in the celestial sphere. 
when we first got aids to our vision, our first telescopes, we looked up and we saw life. We saw roadways, we saw canals, we saw civilization. And then we got better telescopes. And we recognized that those are just natural features on the surface of Mars. But we never lost that idea that maybe Mars was alive. And that's understandable. It's a profound thought. It's a profound question, you know. Are we alone? Are we alone in our universe? Are we alone in our solar system? Could one of our nearest neighbors harbor life? Well, NASA has been trying to answer that question for decades. First with the, in, in the 70s with the Viking missions, and then later with rovers. Now, if you want to get to the surface of Mars, you've got to do four things. We call it entry, descent, and landing, but it's really four pieces to the puzzle. You hit the atmosphere going approximately 10,000 miles an hour, 5.9 kilometers a second. For us, on landing night, we were going 13,327 miles an hour. That's fast. In fact, that's fast enough that the kinetic energy, the energy of motion, can melt or vaporize the entire spacecraft. That's considered totally uncool. So we wrap the spacecraft in a shell, we coat that shell with a material that will smolder and won't burn, and we shed that energy to the sky on Mars, burning a hole in it as we slow down. That process slows us down to about 1,000 miles an hour, still not slow enough to land on the surface of Mars, so we need to open up a parachute. In our case, the world's largest supersonic parachute opened up at Mach 1.7, just shy of twice the speed of sound at Mars. A huge parachute, almost the width of this room when fully opened, gives us a neck snapping 12 Gs of deceleration. That slows us down to a couple hundred miles an hour, about 180 miles an hour or so. Still not slow enough to land on the surface of Mars, so eventually we have to let go of that parachute and go onto rockets. Now, every mission that's ever been successful, that's made it to the surface of Mars, has used these four pieces of the puzzle. But depending on how fancy your rockets are, whether they've got throttles or not, or how good your ability to sense the ground is, you end up with a little tiny bit of velocity left over. We call it error velocity. Yeah, one, 10, 20 miles an hour, and then you need a system to cushion that final blow. Now for us, for Curiosity, our touchdown error was one and a half miles an hour. That is a brisk walk. The kinetic energy is one three millionth of one percent of the arrival kinetic energy, and yet the, the engineering of that touchdown system gave us some of the greatest challenges. Where we were landing was no easy feat either. This is another image of the Gale Crater. This is now shaded relief. Orange is high, blue is low. You can see the nice flat landing zone. And I've overlaid all the uncertainty ellipses of every successful mission to Mars. These are the 99th percentile hits. And you can see that as time has gone on, we've gotten better at finding where Mars is and getting more accurate. But to land on the safe blue flats, we are going to have to do a quantum better, this mission. And when we got down there, we weren't landing just any old rover. Here is a, uh, here's a family portrait of the rovers we've put on Mars. You can see starting in 97 with a little Sojourner rover about the size of a microwave oven. Very important because we were able to put her down on the surface of Mars for less than one-tenth that which we had spent on the Viking missions in the 70s. In fact, we were so happy to be spending so little, only $350 million, that we said we would go back every single opportunity we could. They come every 26 months because of the way that Mars and the Earth move around the sun. Now, you'll notice there's a little bit more than 26 months between 97 and 2004. 
it ends up being we were playing a little bit of a limbo game. We said, that was great. You did a mission for $350 million. Totally awesome. Can you do two missions for $350 million? No, you can't. In fact, you cannot, all you really can do for that much money is make a smoking hole on the surface of Mars. <laughs> and you don't get a lot of credit for doing that, I can tell you that. But we rallied, and in 2004, we put twin rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, on the surface of Mars. And they were important because they taught us that liquid water had been on the surface. And we know from here on Earth that liquid water is present where there's life. But they couldn't tell us some important things about the water. Was it salty? Was it sweet? Had it been there for a long time? Was it acidic? Was it basic? In short, was that ancient wet Mars habitable for life? Well, in comes curiosity. 900 kilos, chock full of all the science instruments necessary to answer that question of habitability. But at 900 kilos, she is really hard to land. She's big compared to rovers. She's big compared to human objects. And it was that final piece of the puzzle, the touchdown system, that gave us the greatest challenge. And when we emerged, we had this idea. We called it direct placement, but very rapidly it took on the vernacular, the sky crane. And as Dave mentioned, we knew two things when we emerged from that room. One, sound engineering principles had led us to that solution. And two, every time we spoke of it, people would say we were crazy. In fact, I did a lot of the speaking, and I can remember starting to talk about it and just feeling my credibility drain into the floor. In fact, I got so tired of it, I came up with a pithy little statement I would make before I'd ever even begin to discuss the sky crane. Uh, pen and paper, computer simulation. Here is um, one of millions of computer simulations that we conducted before we ever tried to land on Mars. Here we're landing on a slope so steep and so slippery, the rover can barely rove. And yet we're able to land her safely. Results like this buoyed our confidence. But analysis in general, modeling certainly, and simulation don't protect you against sins of omission, the I forgots. When I build a model of the universe in my computer in ones and zeros, if I omit an important law of physics, an important phenomena or behavior, the computer won't tell me that. It will just dutifully turn the crank on some weird, strange little universe I've created inside of its bowels and give me an answer that may or may not have anything to do with what we should rightly experience when it comes time to land on Mars. So after 10 years of investment and $2 billion spent, we had to gather the team together and essentially collectively hold our breaths and ask the question, had we done a great folly or perhaps a great work? Coming up on the tree. Vehicle reports entry interface. At this time, it'll begin pressurizing the propulsion system to increase the thrust of the system. Uh, we'll use that for all the maneuvering in the atmosphere we're about to do. The vehicle's just reported via tones that it has started guided entry. We have seen peak deceleration. We should have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. Parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. Feet chill step has separated. We're on the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers in descending. Standing by for back shell separation. We are in powered flight. We're at an altitude of 1 kilometer descending. Standing by for sky crane. 
Sky Green is started. Single to us, you remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. <laughs> Well, that was a good night. You know, infinitely preferable to the alternative that could have awaited us if the work of over 3,170 some odd women and men at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, and thousands others across 37 states in the U.S. and seven nations around the globe didn't come together that night to make that outcome. Now, I know for myself and I know for many of my team members, the ones and zeros that come down that tell you that the rover's done its job, they take the front of my brain to figure out. And they don't connect me as viscerally to our decade-long effort as these. These are the first images of a new place in our solar system brought to you by the blood, sweat, and tears of those women and men across the U.S. and around the globe. They are, from the right going left, the first image of Mount Sharp seen from the surface of Gale Crater. This has taken a couple of days after landing. We've removed the uh, dust covers that block and protect the lenses. We get a nice clear image. You can see Mount Sharp in the background, the rover's uh, shadow in the foreground, and in the mid, the beautiful black sand dunes that, that separate us from the foothills of Mount Sharp. In the center, the first color image of the surface of Gale Crater, this taken by an imager on our robotic arm. Also, a few days after landing, we have not removed the clear dust cover that protected the lens, and the red iron oxide rich dust that gives Mars its red color gives this image a ghostly red hue. But my favorite image for the entire mission is the one in the far left. This is the very, very first image taken from the surface of Gale Crater. We had a, a satellite above us as we were landing. And that is the communication pathway through which all the telemetry, all the data you saw us reacting to in the control room was passing through that link. We were just about to lose that link. It had been timed perfectly just to cover our landing. And we thought we might have just enough time and just enough bandwidth for one image, and we chose that image. It's from the rear hazard cameras. These are fisheye lens cameras down low on the bottom of the rover. They're there to protect the rover when she's driving around. These are the ones on the rear. And we chose that camera and that image at that moment because we were kind of just hoping against hope we just might see that. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Whoa. What? You might have to trust me, but that is actually the impact plume of our descent stage, our jet backpack, hitting the surface of Mars after it's dropped us off. You know? So, Thank you. so 30 days after landing, we took this beautiful mosaic images underneath the bottom of the rover to make sure we hadn't landed her on a rock. If we'd landed on a rock, I probably wouldn't be here speaking to you. And then NASA patted the landing team on the back and said, go find work. After all, we were kind of the movers. We we're just the guys getting the rover to the spot. All right, there's your rover. Have a good time. And a whole new team of people, 400 strong across those seven nations that I spoke of came together to drive the rover and figure out where we wanted to take her. 
They made beautiful decisions, and within six months of our two-year mission, we had drilled holes into the bedrock of a place called the Yellowknife Bay and brought up a blue, gray, powdery material, distributed it to science instruments inside the belly of the rover, and given the scientists back here on Earth the data they needed to answer the question that Curiosity had been sent to ask. The question is, was ancient, wet Mars habitable for life? And the answer is yes. Three billion years ago, when life was just getting a toehold here on Earth, the conditions to support life were ripe on the surface of Mars. It's kind of profound. We don't know whether life started in both places at the same time. We actually know that during that period of the solar system's evolution, the two planets actually communicated with one another because of what's called the late early bombardment, in which we were being struck by asteroids and ejecta was flying both back and forth between the two planets. So life could have started here on Earth and been ejected to Mars, could have started on both places simultaneously, or it could have started on Mars and been ejected to Earth and we're all Martians. That's kind of a weird thought, but it's in the decision tree. So here she is. Her name's Curiosity. She's doing our Curiosity's bidding on the surface of Mars. I love this image. It's a beautiful panorama. You see Mount Sharp. You see the spacecraft. But this image opens a question for me. Why do we do this? Why do I do this? Why did I do this? Why did I spend 10 years of my life designing a rover, designing a landing system, to put a robot on Mars to root around in the dirt? Is that particularly practical? I mean, sometimes when I think about human behavior and practicality, I get a little confused. But some things I know are practical that us humans do. Like when we explore, we're really asking questions of our humanity. Who are we? How grand are we? How great is our reach? What questions might we dare to ask and hope to be able to answer? Now, I've been thinking a lot about this, this exploration, our curiosity that drives it, mostly since landing. You know, I had a great job. I was engineering this thing. We were building this device. It worked. And then people kind of freaked out. I was in Barcelona at an airport. Somebody says, you are the Mars landing guy. I said, I'm not the Mars landing guy. I'm one of thousands of Mars landing people. But, uh, but thank you for that. I recognized that what we were doing, what we were representing, was our humanity that our exploration was in some sense a gesture of our humanity, and that makes perfect sense. Because curiosity is in the depth of our genetic makeup. It's in our genes, born through hips too narrow to pass a fully baked human brain. All of us come into this world naked and incapable. In fact, that's our bag. We come in almost completely unprogrammed, with very few lines of code. Perhaps the most important is be curious. And we all are. Every single one of us in this room, whether you identify as curious or not, you started to make your own model of the world, starting at time zero, driven only by your curiosity. I've got a one-year-old boy. I watch him pour sand and water onto his hands, into his diaper, and he is learning about the universe, driven by his own innate curiosity. Before he could speak, he knew about mass, length, time, gravity, the difference between a solid and a liquid. We all did that. Now, an interesting thing happens. As we get older, we start relying on that model that we first built when we were at T0. And we don't necessarily recognize the world as it really is and bring our sort of native curiosity to bear upon it. If we do, 
our minds stay agile and we stay competitive and innovative. In fact, that curiosity and our exploration help drive and change our world. So what's next for NASA? Where will NASA's curiosity next take it? Well, the National Science Foundation, the National Research Council, the U.S. body of great thinkers has been telling us for a while that we should bring samples of Mars back to Earth. Because to really unlock the mysteries of Mars, you've got to bring Mars back to Earth. It's a hard job. It takes three separate projects, but NASA is stepping up, and the first of those projects is due to launch in the year 2020 and take samples for eventual return to Earth. Well, I'm the chief engineer of that project, thankfully. But Mars is not the only place to explore. Europa, the ice moon of Jupiter, a thin ice crust, a mile, five miles, 10 miles. We don't really know the thickness of the ice crust. We know it's thick enough to protect a liquid water ocean that we know is more than twice the volume of all the seas on Earth. Protected by that, that crust of ice, that liquid water ocean is a place to explore. Now, I'm no exobiologist, but I drink beer with exobiologists. And they tell me that their best bet for where life is existing today in our solar system is this icy moon of Jupiter. And I hope to help NASA put a lander on the surface of that ice and see what evidence of life has upwelled. So now this image is a beautiful image to me. It used to fill me with terror. It used to wake me up every night. It doesn't do that anymore. It makes me feel strangely both proud and humble. Proud to have been part of this great team and humble to have been so lucky to be part of such a gesture of our collective humanity. But this image also opens up a question for me. Where will my curiosity next take me? You know, years ago when I followed my curiosity about the motion of the stars or the apparent motion of the stars in the night sky, my life changed. And maybe I changed the world a little bit because of it. Since that time, I've learned that if I can keep my team members and myself in touch with our native curiosity, we, we create better solutions. We solve more profound problems. So it's a great question for each of us to ask. Perhaps best asked and left unanswered, hanging in the air, wondering, where will your curiosity next take you? Thank you very much for your attention.